what could the potential overall partnership look like? Mm -hmm. Executive finance manager, Roll call, please. <laughs> Carol? Mandy? Here. Yeah. Yo? Here. Glassburner? Here. Kurt? Here. Frank? Williamson? Here. Dewey? Here. You have eight or nine present, sir. You have a point. Well, welcome to our new members. Some of us have been in the for a while, but Mr. Gale, Miss Ingrid, welcome. Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman, 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 Approve the agenda 17 point is what I have in front of me. Motion by Manning, second by Cooey. Discussion none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Exposed no. All right. Public comment. Anybody from the public? Number five. Number five. Minutes, minutes. From April 2nd. Everybody got a chance to look at our April 2nd meeting minutes? Cooey's motion. I'll second. Kurt, all those in favor of approving the minutes from April 2nd, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Public comment. How are numbers? Is there all workers over here? We, we held a meeting once where, uh, yeah. <laughs> Reports. That would be our administrator. Okay. So I have quite a few uh, things to report today. First of all, Larry Herbs is here. This is Larry. He is our new finance director. He started April 29th. Um, his jump right in is already just an outstanding part of the team. He's getting familiar with all the various departments and the accounting structures. He spent some time out at Pine Valley last week. We're going to get him some time over at HHS to learn about what they do and how they do it. So, um, but yeah, he's just jumping right in. Larry, would you like to say anything? I just, I'm glad to be aboard. Um, you know, I'm just getting my feet wet. Um, we got a great group. Everybody I've met so far has been very helpful and very accommodating. So I give you credit for that. Uh, they have a lot of great people, and that's a, that's hard to get in this environment. So I give you credit for that. Larry's a CPA with uh, 36 years. 36, yeah. Experience. So we are very, very fortunate to have gotten him. And so we're really, really excited. Um, Next thing, so we're currently reviewing CIP expenditures for 2024, looking at where everyone's at, how their expenditures are going, um, evaluating certain projects that maybe aren't going to get done so we can reallocate those funds to something else. And then we're prepping for 2025, so we'll be starting to have meetings with each department um, here in the next week. Um, all of our budget meetings are set for Every single uh, department as well. So we're going to do the same thing as we did last year, the one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, so it'll be myself, Derek, and Larry meeting with each department and their accounting staff. Um, and in some cases, even maintenance staff, we may bring it, you know, Pine Valley maintenance was not included in a lot of the expenditures that went on there um, were, were never really accounted for. So we're going to do, you know, do the process and tweak it as we need to. But um, I'm excited to say that it's already all scheduled and ready to go. So we're we're going to work towards that. Uh, we're hoping to get work, worksheets out by July 1 so that we can move things along a little more quickly. Last year, because I came on board so late, we did all of the department meetings in two days. We don't want to do that again this year. We want to have a little more time. So um, maintenance of effort. So it's a new... Um, a new requirement by the state that we fill out a report basically that says that we are maintaining the level of service or greater than what we had the prior year for EMS. Um, most, most areas is law enforcement, EMS, and fire. For us, because we are a county, we are only required to file the, um, the ambulance piece of it, the EMS. So Derek is working with Amber on that. It is required that the county clerk should fill that out. So this will be our first year. It's new in 2024 for everyone. Deadline is July 1, so they are already ahead of the game. We've been working on it for a couple of weeks. Um, the other thing that we are working through now is the DOR or the DOL um, basically initiated their or released their final rule on the Fair Labor Standards Act exempt changes, which means that if you are exempt, they they altered the salary thresholds. Uh, because they're finding that 
well, basically people were being taken advantage of. Um, and so there are several new thresholds. Um, so before July 1 of 2024, you had to meet the threshold of $684 per week is what you needed to make in order to meet the duties test and the salary test. Now, um, as of July 1, 2024, it is going to increase to $844 per week. And then in 2025, it goes up to $1,128 per week. And then after July 2027, every three years thereafter, there's going to be a data methodology that they're going to release for us to look at. Um, long story short is we need to look at all of our exempt employees and we need to figure out if they are making enough to meet the salaries test. If they are not, they can no longer then be considered exempt and we have to pay them overtime or we have to increase the wage to meet the minimum threshold. Um, so this is a really opportune time for our wage study to come into play because we know we're off the market and it may be that once we're adjusted appropriately, we will meet these these wage tests. But again, so we're looking through that to evaluate, um, you know, if we need to make those adjustments immediately, because we all know we do not want to uh, be paying people inaccurately. That's that's not a good thing, and there are heavy fines that go along with that. So we're working through that. So there are several different tests. There's a duties test. So some of them are administrative. Some of them are. Well, here I can. I have all the hullabaloo. Um, so yeah, duties tests, administrative employees, professional employees. So there are, if you need a license, it's one thing. If your duties are predominantly administrative and you meet a certain salary threshold, you can be considered exempt. Um, so there's all these, these, these are the pages of so there's different thresholds. Yeah. I mean, it's all these different pages of stuff that you have to look at to determine whether or not someone is exempt. It typically used to be your high level employees, really. Um, you know, but there's specific things for salary employees or specific things for computer technologist employees. So, I mean, it's, it's all over the map, but for us, it's really, um, a lot of our human services, our social workers, all of our department heads, um, our confidential secretary. Um, trying to think, so there's a huge listing of who is and who isn't. Supposedly right now, Tammy, um, was actually pretty shocked when I asked her, they don't even keep track of it. The 400 can't keep track of it. So there's a spreadsheet. So again, the need for a new system rises to the top, but we're going to look at it and we'll get it. You know, narrowed down and, and nailed down. So we'll get that taken care of. Um. The other thing that we're looking at doing is, and Shapanda and I were talking about a staff who had a TB test and then required a chest x-ray. And I said, we'll send them over to occupational med. Because typically when you have employees that need a, a physical or maybe need a fitness for duty or a CDL exam or anything like that, you have a contract or you send them to occupational medicine. We don't have anything in place with occupational medicine. So even if we have an on the job injury and they need to go to a provider, typically we would send them then to occupational medicine. Um, so we are meeting with the Richland Hospital and we are also meeting with another provider and well, two more providers to talk to them about getting a contract for occupational medicine. Um, and that would be any county employee then that would need to go for those sorts of reasons. We could send them and we just have an agreed upon amount because if you wait for work comp, then you're paying higher rates and it's all sorts of other other things. So we should have an occupational medicine contract. So we're looking at doing that right now. Are um, we in the consortium at the hospital for drug testing, like for CDL drivers now? That I have to ask Josh. I don't know. I don't know if he gets them done there. Be, a lot of chiropractic offices do that now too. So I don't know if he does it there. We used to be part of the hospital consortium. It's a bunch of Yeah. So that's what we need to find out. And if we can get it all rolled into one contract, why wouldn't we do that rather than having three or four first out ones? Um, so uh, campus, just a little bit of an update there. Venture uh, architects, those were that's who we awarded the RFP to for the um, study. They were on site for two days 
April 25th and 26th, the 25th, they started at eight in the morning and I believe they were running around until about seven o'clock that night on the campus. So they got the full assessment done out there that day. And on the 26th, they spent the day between the community services building and our building, um, doing all the analysis, taking photos, all of that stuff. So that is well underway. Um, they have asked for some follow up data, which is um, they wanted data on our jail population for the last 5 plus years. So, Devin was very kind and provided that for me and even divided it up by male and female, which I think will be relevant to how you can separate out and classifications going forward. Um, next phase will be conducting meetings with employee groups. So we work together to determine which employees should be grouped together pretty much based on job duties. So the courts will kind of be in one area. Community services will be in one. Um, the rest of the courthouse will be in another. And so we'll just, um, they're going to send out questionnaires. We actually have homework. So it's going to be to state how many filing cabinets do you have? How big are they? You know, things like that. What do you need to operate your office so that they can then utilize that data to determine, you know, going forward, what kind of questions or what kind of discussions they want to have when they have those one on one meetings to determine our space needs. So um, they're working on getting those packets together. I've spoken with someone from each group and asked them to kind of be the keeper of their group's data. And then we'll get that back to venture and then we'll be scheduling meetings. They said, typically it takes about 2 weeks to complete the packet of information and then they'll come on site and hold those meetings. So we're, we're moving right along in that process. Um, I will be meeting with Josh Lee from Laval telephone cooperative tomorrow. Uh, in 2022, there was a public private partnership agreement signed allocating ARPA funds to Laval, um, it's to the tune of $590,000. $295,000 will be giving, given to them when they start the project and $295,000 upon completion. And so they're anticipating starting this fall and completing by the end of 2025. Um, these funds will basically run 75 miles of fiber and serve 460 residents. So I'm just gonna meet with him see if the scope has changed, but um, just a heads up, we've kind of been waiting for that request to come in and it finally has. So that'll be moving. Uh, we had a meeting with Tessa last week, myself, Larry, Derek, and Justin. Um, and she is from David Drown Associates. She is the consultant that will be guiding us through our wage study. So we have decided to, um, she sent all the documentation, so we're getting ready to kick that off. We're going to have employee meetings on June 11th. Tessa will be on site basically the whole entire day and into the evening. So we're going to do employee sessions at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and 1 p.m. We're going to record at least one of those sessions so that we can get it out to all employees and also get it on the Relias website for those at Pine Valley uh, because it's just so difficult for them to step away and get to meetings. Um, then at 2 p.m., she will be attending the department head meeting to give them instructions on their role and what can be expected as we progress through. And then at 5 p.m., she will be coming to speak to all of you. So she'll have a PowerPoint presentation. She will again talk to you about the process, show you what the documentation looks like, and kind of walk you through the timeline and expectations. Um, so that's really exciting that we're getting to move forward on that. Um, biographies, those who haven't completed your bios, please get them to me as soon as possible. Um, some of you have emailed asking for more time. That's fabulous. But if you're struggling with the technology or any of that, please let me know. Um, I want to make sure that we can distribute them to everyone next week uh, at the board meeting. So, and then I will be attending the cows meeting on Thursday. Other than that, I think that's enough for now. There's more, but. <laughs> Questions for administrator Beth? June 11th. Yep. If not, any questions for her? Let's move to start of the strip list items at Pine Valley. <laughs> okay, so last time, well, I don't know, I think last time we chatted, 
we were talking about how we had identified, uh, well, not me, but the staff at Pine Valley had identified the fact that there's that huge garage out back. I don't even know how many stalls are in it, five or six, um, that were just full of a lot of really junk. Um, and then there had been purchased a shipping container. And that shipping container was behind that building, and that was also full of quite a bit of junk. So um, Randy and Josh assisted Chad out there, and they got him a dumpster. They got him the um, the skid loader out there, and they're going to rip up some concrete so that they can pour new concrete, make a better seal, so critters aren't getting underneath because we've had critters in there. Um, but there were old wheelchairs. There was medicines from back when they did the move. Pieces of linoleum, uh, I mean, lawnmowers, old AC units, you name it. I mean, there was just stuff in there. So they're getting that all cleaned out so we can make better use of that space. Anything that's metal that can be sold, they're putting in one area. So Chad said it's it's coming along and they've got the main building almost completely cleaned out, which is really exciting. So that way, hopefully, they can actually utilize it for maybe vehicles and some of the things that they need to use it for. So that's very exciting. So kudos to that, good job. Questions? Moving on to number eight, resolution relating to canceling sale county debt. All right, this is me. Um, this is an annual um, action we take annually each year. Uh, for this year, we'll be writing off Stale checks issued calendar year 2022, totaling $621.16. Um, again, majority of these are checks that were issued for county fair proceeds to participants that ultimately didn't get cashed for a dollar, two dollars, or a dollar fifty. Have we we have changed that or have we have not changed that? Uh, not yet. I spoke with Derek on what I think would be a possible solution. Now that we have a new county fair coordinator, um, I think it would be a good time to look at overhauling how we pay out county fair proceeds. So from us, you need a motion and a second to approve yep. the scale check. To take it to county board. So moved, Mr. Hamrish, and by Mr. Carroll. Further discussion from our committee. We do it yearly and hopefully we'll have some changes. I'd like to see what it costs us to write a dollar fifty check. So <laughs> probably more than that. If there is no discussion, I will take your vote on approving the six hundred and twenty-one dollar and sixteen cent write off of stale checks. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. All right. Stale checks can be wrote off. Uh, number nine, state canceling state sales tax certificates for the year 2011 and making a appropriation. Mr. Chair. Yep. So this is following uh, state statute 75.20. Um, if uh, tax certificates are on the books for 11 years, they are to be written off by the county. Uh, they are listed on the following page with the resolution. Um, Typically, these are properties that have been previously identified by the county as possibly contaminated. Historically, the county has um, kind of left these alone. Um, one parcel you'll see is owner unknown that um, I can't see much of the notes from 2011, but typically that is when a, a parcel correction is made and the extra parcel that no longer exists just waits in the weeds until we eventually write it off. So um, I do believe this parcel number will be gone after next year. We may have to write it off one more time. Um, other than that, Mayland Acres is going in the paper this week and is in our foreclosure process. But uh, $243.48 is what we'll be looking to write off and reappropriate. That is less than normal, correct? It, Varies by the year, typically to the very low value properties. Oh, oh yes. say, Mr. Man, second by Ingrid. Any further discussion on this, Mr. Carroll? He just a little more on what do you mean by contaminated and how that's determined. 
So how the county has determined it in the past um, has usually just been by supervisors knowing their own areas. Uh, so this, typically it's, uh, so like the Silver and Creamery Company was a parcel that had either a small gas pump or it was an area that was a former cheese factory. Um, same story with the Coakley property that's in the town of Willow and Lloyd. That is an old cheese factory that still has all of the buildings still, most of the buildings still remaining. Um, and then as far as Stacey Gander, I think it's believed that there was a former gas station on that property. So typically what historically it's just been accepted that there's been a former gas station with underground tanks. Um, typically, these cheese factories were subject to contamination with their own underground tanks or just dumping the whey um, in the ground. So, if the county takes it, there's a there's a potential that we would be liable to clean it up. And depending on what the site becomes, I will say the DNR is offering workshops on what mechanisms are out there for counties to try and start working on these properties, but. The first one was three and a half hours away, so I'm waiting for one that's closer to our area. So there may not be actual test results, just physical problem. Right now it's probability. I do know that there were some incentive programs for the EPA and they would come in and do a little workshop and do some testing at one point. I don't know if they're still doing that, but it, that was kind of the same story that I got from the city was everybody just said, oh, it's contaminated, but nobody really knew what there had really been the tests. So, um, you know, it would take some dollars to do that. And I believe the DNR is trying to streamline that. Um, one of my first years as treasurer uh, at one of our seminar conferences, they covered this and it was a coordinated effort between the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation, the EPA, the DNR, your county, um, any local um, economic development entity that you had, and it was just a mess. You would have to dedicate a staff just to handling your contaminated properties. Um, it sounds like they may be trying to streamline this a little bit, so maybe it would be more user friendly for a county to work on getting these cleaned up. But um, yeah, the first steps would be getting it tested and finding the mechanism to do that economically for us. 20 some years ago, you used to be able to take that contaminant and top shred it. We're going to go over it to a son that have it tested. Uh, last I knew, it was either Madison or LaCroft that's got to go. So it is very expensive. Yeah, they had grown to it years ago, and you don't hear anything about it anymore. Any further questions regarding the property? We have a motion and a second. For the discussion, all those in favor of writing off the two hundred and forty-three dollars and forty-eight cents, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. All right. Moving on to number ten. Ms. Fish. So you all have a packet in front of you, and the reason why the packet is in front of you and not uploaded because you will see it says confidential. <laughs> so we will have a discussion, but it won't be an exact. Let's put it that way because this is a quotation. Um, so we have, as you all know, been on the hunt for an HR, payroll, and finance system. Um, you know, I've talked to a few people, I'm familiar with some systems. And so we had a couple initial calls and then a on-site with Tyler Technologies. And it was myself, Jeff, Larry, um, Justin, Tammy Wheelock, and Derek um, in the initial, just because honestly, we didn't think this was going to meet our needs and we were pleasantly surprised. So since that time, I've also engaged, um, asked some questions of Pine Valley and worked with Stephanie over at HHS to get some additional questions and making sure that this is something that could work for us. The beauty of this system is it is an all in one system. So no parsing together, you know, chronos and then a different financial system and then, you know, another system over here. This system, you input the data once and it carries out through the entire thing and that's HR, uh, payroll, finance. It also has um, document manager, which is really outstanding because we have a lot of documents, a lot of old books and policies and different things that we would like to scan in. 
So it has a content manager. The budgeting piece of this software is outstanding. It will increase transparency for our constituents. It has a dashboard and on that dashboard, they can click down to a department and they could even, if we wanted them to be able to search a line item like boots and it will pull up the entire amount of money the county has spent on boots in that year. Um, it's really, and we have the, we can control how much or how little it gets put out there, but really, really outstanding. The training comes with it. Um, this would have time clocks. It does scheduling. It does pretty much anything we would need it to do. And we were pleasantly surprised because we really thought that this would be something that maybe wasn't affordable for us. So we pulled the data on how much we spend on all of the separate systems that we have right now. And currently, we pay $101,492.58 for one, two, three, four, five, six, six systems that we know of. And we think there are probably more than this, but these are just the ones that we can pick out. And so if you look at our total cost for this system annually, it's $107,098. So we will have better usability and functionality for $6,000 more a year. So it's pretty exciting. And you know, this has been a goal. This was in a strategic plan. It's been a goal of mine since I came on and to just see the benefits enrollment. We can manage our grants more easily. We can do our HR, our accounting, our CIP. Um, Larry, what else did, did it, you know, you really like about Well, it's just very nice. It's kind of an onboarding process. The HR onboarding process alone is going to save us significantly instead of having a, you know, right now we're going through a stack of paperwork this thick every time we onboard something. <laughs> that onboarding process can be able to automate through this system. Yeah. So we won't have to do that. Um, you know, the spreadsheets that she's keeping on exempt and not exempt, you can't imagine the amount of spreadsheets that are kept up in that accounting office, especially on payroll. Just the exempt and non exempt spreadsheets, or they when they go from one scale to another scale, but she has to do that. She's manually calculating that by hand. I looked at that spreadsheet today, it was about five pages long, color coded. When somebody works in this position and they're paid at this level, and then it goes to this position, and they got to get paid at that level. That is a mechanical calculation right now. She's going through everybody that does that. So if you got a person that's your employee at the county and they're working in two different jobs and two different scales, that's a process. That's, that's, it's, it's, you know. Well, and it doesn't just happen here. Yes. So Trish has accounting staff that go through and look at all of her stuff once. They check it. They send over a spreadsheet that's this big with seven pages to it front and back, column after column after column. Then Tammy has to look at it and go through it. And then they make sure everything lines up and then it's finally inputted by hand into the system. So again, I mean, the manual, the manual hours that are put into just processing payroll, that's not even the finance, that's not even all the rest of it are mind numbing. And this is every week because it's so inefficient that Tammy's not able to do all the payrolls in one week. She doesn't have the hours. So you, she does half one week, half of the county gets paid on one week and the next half of the county gets paid on the next week. Whereas, you know, when we ask the question, how long would it take to run this payroll for the entire county? What did he say? A few hours? Four yeah, hours? A fraction of what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so again, just really um, outstanding. Yeah. Everybody on your team buys into that that they can do for six grand because I, I, anytime I've been a part of a migration from one software system to another, the, the migration always goes over. Yeah. I, I just wonder what kind of assurance or protection we have. This. So they're, they've done this almost, well, a significant amount of the counties are on the AS400. So they've done this multiple times in multiple counties. Tyler is a government focused uh, system. So the majority of their clients are government entities, municipalities, counties, cities. But they recognize they do. the mess we get. They do. Okay. They know exactly what we have. 
Um, and it's basically going to be a, the way they described it, an export. They would export the data and then import it in. I mean, not that it's not going to be work for all of us, because there's going to be a lot of manual stuff that we we know that we know that. Export it goes away then. Yes. Or replaces the hardware bus. Tyler. Tyler. It's got the finance system as well. Okay. It all talks. It's a cloud-based system, so there's no. It's a cloud-based system, so there's no additional need for this hardware. No, they told him right. Which is why the document manager and the content manager is so outstanding as well. So all of the old ordinances, all of, not the ordinances there, but the it's, resolutions, the yeah, all the stuff that the binders that we want to get rid of can be managed in here. The other nice thing about it is right now, let's say we have a new policy. We have to send that out to everybody on paper. We have to sign it. We have to get it back. We can create and manage all of that documentation in this system and it will upload directly into their employee record. The other um, really nice thing, if we require someone to have a license, we can upload that here. If we want to track county equipment, we can actually put in the serial numbers and document that we issued them a cell phone on this date, it was in this condition and take a picture. We it issued them an iPad on this date, we can take a picture. So that if we have items that are damaged, we can assess those costs then back to the employee. I mean, and you can't make this up. I had a gal who got a brand new cell phone, a horse stepped on it. And then she was bucking because we told her she had to pay for it. No, it's county equipment. You were using it for personal use. Your horse stepped on it. You have to pay to replace that. So we can have documentation that will will track those things. Um, so, yes. Yeah, no. Uh, it sounds great, but I'm just wondering in terms of multiple quotes and making sure we we looked over the, the field. What were there some other options you guys looked at? So for IFS, it was thirty five thousand dollars a year just for integrated financial systems and about eighty thousand for implementation costs for that one program, and that was only for accounting, and it couldn't do nearly this. Um, UKG, I have experience with them. I had 325 employees and I didn't even have all of the modules that could do everything that this can do. And quarterly, it was $26,000. Initial implementation was close to 100,000. Um, and so the other one that we have looked at now is Avenue, um, which is basically the same providers of the 400. We sat in on their demo. They had, um, they couldn't show us the actual functionality of the programs. They had screenshots and they said, well, this is what it will do. And when we ask them who else is using it, they don't have anyone where we had several um, references for Tyler and Larry called every single one of them that we were given and great reviews. Um, so how long would our contract be for the time? So. If the initial contract is three years, the initial contract term is three years and I was able to negotiate the price down to this because I said, what if we pay for all three years up front? Because we were planning to use ARPA dollars to, to do this, it's infrastructure so that if we ever have a COVID again, we can function more effectively and more efficiently utilizing this system. Trish had additional dollars left over that she also kicked in so we could pay that upfront. That money has to be used by December of this year. So the the one time cop fees are completely covered by ARPA. And the next two years of the recurring. Wow. We could we have the funds set aside to, because we thought we were going to be paying for separate systems yeah. far more than yeah, this. Right? So and when you look at what we're currently spending, it really is a win. And that gives us time then to basically set aside that money that we otherwise would have spent to be prepared at the end of the three years to then pay for those contracts going forward. Start with. Yep. So this isn't a question, it's more a statement. I'm just kind of shocked that it's like this because I remember talking about this when we created the strategic plan three years ago and kind of the implication at that time was it was basically unrealistic to even look for a system that could integrate everything because it was going to be astronomical cost. Yep. Was that not true or has things changed since then? I don't know. 
I mean, what I can tell you again is that just UKG alone was this much money a year. And that's only one function, right? And that was, right. yeah, and that wasn't so financial. Yeah, you had three so different functions. we didn't functions. know about SA at that point? No, because you're talking SAP and stuff like that. And, and once you go down them roles, I mean, they're millions of dollars. I would, yeah, I, mean, I was surprised, to be honest with you. We all uh, talked. Well, it's <laughs> going to be 107000 Well, and the other thing, they're a source well partner with WCA. So I think that plays into it. We also have a Tyler contract currently with the VA. Uh, they are the ones that do our VA software. So we got a discount of 25% for that. And then we negotiated. We said, all right, we can pay up front. What can you do for us? How many colleges? How many colleges would you do? I talked to two colleges. Two colleges. Yeah, two colleges. But there's more than two. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, you want someone who's proven. How long have they been using it? Uh, both of them have been just a little over a year, so they've been through the cycle. Both okay. of them have been through their cycles. No, no big issues or anything? They were not but complimentary. They were, and I will tell you, just my experience with the AS400, I started a couple weeks ago. I think they finally got me on board on Friday. And I took a call every day from Barb, and they eventually took a call from me, and a call from Derek in order to get them to respond. And so we, we questioned that when they came in and did their demo also, that their service levels were going to improve. <laughs> and obviously they said yes, but. But they did really, they paused and they said, well, and we just kind of looked at each other and went, absolutely not. Not good. I didn't hear it with Barb. We have spoken with Barb, yes. I'm just thinking about the security piece and how it's different. The nice thing is that that's on them. That's not on us, that's on them because it's cloud based. So it's their responsibility to secure all of our data. Okay. So they, they do understand what our requirements are. Um, and I will say, so Derek had worked with Tyler previously, and I had known of counties that worked with Tyler previously before this version came out. And this version is unlike their prior products. I mean, heads and tails, so much better. Um, just unbelievably exciting. Honestly, we all walked out going, holy moly, this is great. Um, not what we were expecting at all. Um, and the fact that they've worked with other counties is nice because we're not reinventing the wheel. I've done an implementation where we were the first to go and it was awful. Now, at least there are other counties we can reach out to if we're struggling and say, oh, okay, how did you deal with this situation? Or, you know, what happened when you did this? And we can, you know, we can bounce ideas off each other. So, um, so at that rate, this is what we're presenting to you, asking for your approval to move forward with. Um, when they asked us how quickly we wanted to do this, we said yesterday, and they said we could be up and running in eight months. So this will take all your payroll. So everybody who works for the county is going to run through this now. The only one that won't would be Pine Valley. So what are we going to do with that? Because we are going to do an import. We can do a flat file import of their financials into the system and also their payroll. Um, Highway, we believe we can integrate their time clock and switch that over to us. Clay is more than open to switching his time card system into something like this. So that'll be great. We can get that all on one. Even Mike Hardy just purchased something that was like $110 just because it's so hard to track all of the people that come in and work an hour here, an hour there. And we'll be able to get Simons on that same so they can clock in, clock out, and, and track all of that time. I mean, because that's me is sort of the biggest advantage. I mean, the other stuff, you got to work on fine. I get that. But the way we do payroll, this is insane. I it mean, is. I don't well, know. That's never happened to Tammy. Well, that's what I mean. You're, you're relying on one person to manage through all that at one point, right? I mean, it takes many people to get into her. Right. Just like you said, she's checking it. I, mean, yeah. I don't know how you, we can expect that. To, we can't expect that much work out of her. Well, and the nice thing, it'll make it better for the supervisors, too, because, I mean, they're going to be the ones then who are responsible to look at their employees time and correct that before it even gets to, let's say, you know, Megan, who is 
really been tasked with looking at all those timesheets and making sure everything's correct. Well, now, rather than all of it going to Megan to look at, it will be, you know, each supervisor is responsible for their eight or 10 people to make sure that's right and it's corrected before it ever gets to Megan. And who knows, we may be able to eliminate a lot of those middlemen too. It may just be that the supervisor can do it once it's signed off on, Trish signs off, and then it goes to Tammy, done. That's how it used to work for me. Ingrid's got a question for you. So how does that work? I guess explain to me a little bit on a lower level from my understanding. How does that explain our work for uh, Pine Valley? You said a flat file at Comfort. Are they gonna be doing separate payroll then? So Pine Valley right now, because of the way that their systems integrate. So they have a medical um, billing system, they have an electronic record system, and what goes in the electronic record system feeds in because, you know, based on what services they get and all of those things, then it fills out. And, and I know only enough to be dangerous. I do not know the real inner workings of it. But there are also then um, analytics that are tied into their payroll because you know, if certain people are doing certain services, then that's billed at a certain rate and all of that ties in together. Medicaid as well. Medicaid, Medicare, all of those things. And they're, they're so complex that I don't know that Tyler is built for what they need. Their needs are just so substantially different that the more we looked at it and talked about it, could we do it? We probably could, but it would be one of those reinventing the wheel situations. And I don't think, and for them, Kronos costs them $900 a month. And that has all of their reporting, all of that stuff is already pre built to work with their medical software and their medical billing and all of that. So it just didn't seem to make sense to upset that Apple cart and try to reinvent the wheel here um, for this piece. But what they can do then is they can interface their financial system with our financial system. So unlike now where we have absolutely no access to any of their data, unless we ask for a report, we'll be able to then upload that data right into the system. So they'll be able to upload it you know, weekly, daily, however we set it up. Um, the same is true of their, their payroll. It'll basically be, you know, because we'll have to do that with highway to a point as well. Highway has cost it. They have to break down every hour they spent with piece of equipment and all sorts of stuff. So that will be an import file and Pine Valley will be an import file. Well, the HHS is not the same because they bill on different stuff too. But we can build we can build out their billings. We can do their allocations and all of that when we set up the employee profile. So that's where that's a little bit different because um, we can do it that way up front, where out there you know, if they need a certain medication administered at such a time, it's it's all different. But when I sent Stephanie's um, sheet to him, he said, we've done all of this. This is all stuff we've done before. There's no issue. So, yeah. Uh, can you refresh my memory on the ARP dollars, how we had initially had been full time dispersed, how this changes that? Well, we didn't really have all of them dispersed. There was a giant wish list, basically. And that's what I mean, the wish list, how it's changed. Yep, and the wish list really hasn't changed because we haven't really done anything with that money other than the, um, the allocation that you had put aside for the broadband. Derek, was there anything else? Prior it wasn't, this, was, this would just be under that um, loss of re operational revenues, revenues total that was a large sum that was allocated underneath that um, oh, that spending category, but not to specific products. Right. Strings, but I'm just saying we had a wish list. I'm just wondering if that's going to get changed now or what What other things do we still want to spend with our deadline system this year, right? It is. <laughs> well, and we had a bunch of it allocated because we thought we needed to plug a financial hole that we no longer need to plug. So that's been reallocated. We uh, honestly, we tried to leave a lot of it very free simply because of the fact that the campus was a huge unknown. And we didn't know what expenses would be there that may require our attention. But when you look at operational need and infrastructure, this is probably one of the best ways we could spend that money. Now, will there be money left? Absolutely, there will be money left. And that's then another discussion that we need to have on what's our next priority. What This is a huge one that we're gonna be able to check off, but. 
I do think that there will be more. I think after July, it may become more clear for us once we have the assessment from the Canvas property. And I mean, I can bring that sheet back, that spreadsheet for you guys so that you can take a look. But honestly, it's largely irrelevant at this point. I feel like. Yeah, and that wish list was assembled before lots of these things happen. So you may have, a, there's a large amount of things on that list, but it was really a wish list. <laughs> Yeah, you know, wish list. Like, it was not the only things that were list. allocated by resolution really are those dollars for the um, the right. private project. Yeah, then you budgeted. Well, that was just budget money. What for the campus increase? Yeah, we increased yep. the amount we budgeted for repairs and different things. Yes, out of the normal budget um, for the campus. But we thought, well, because it's such an unknown. Any further questions? Uh, you did quote something about the quote early on that this is this is an exact dollar to a quote that you are waiting. Nope. Um, at this point, the only change would be the interface. Um, but basically, when I talked to him about decreasing the number of employees on here, he said this would actually probably go down um, a little bit because it won't take as many hours to implement with not taking the whole county. So not all 490 employees will be going on this. It'll only be about 350. Um, so he said that implementation time will decrease so that it will actually decrease a little bit. But he said, you know, you won't know until you get into it, but that's, it won't go up, it'll go down. So the resolution could stay up to the $250.173? Yep, and then um, and in addition, we're gonna pay the, the fees for the two years. So we'll pay the one time fees. Yeah, times three. Yeah. Times three. Make a motion to enter it for three year contract. Three year contract. Yep. Motion by Mr. Ready. Seconded by Ingrid. Any further discussions? Sounds like uh it's gonna be out. All those in favor of going with the tiling system, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Yep. All right. Very good. Thank you. We are on to Number 11, discussion and possible action on rental of office space in the community service building. 11A, ADRC. Okay, so Trish and I have a, a monthly standing meeting. And in our meeting, um, she approached me about the ADRC has a regional office, correct? Um, and that's uptown, down from Los Amigos. It's on the other end of the block. There's a small office in a little commercial area and they had inquired about potentially relocating over to our building and renting office space there. Um, this also ties in with item B because the Richland County used to be the campus foundation and is now the community foundation is looking for a space to relocate as well with the potential closure of the campus building. And so when Trish and I were talking, I said, well, how would you feel about you know, the campus foundation also, or the community foundation, and she did seem to have an issue with it. So the question is really, how do you all feel about it? And what do you feel would be an appropriate rental fee? Um, we were thinking $250 a month. That's kind of what other office spaces are going for around you know, the county. But I don't think it would be bad either for the community um, foundation to be located there just because there's a lot of people coming in and out and the ADRC we already have some staff there it would just be the vehicles are parked there so it's like yeah. right any infrastructure changes we have to do that's not a question like uh, ADRC I'm fine with the foundation are they gonna have to they gonna have to have their own entry so yeah. when when I talked to Greg he said he could look at the space um and if if we needed to wall it off or make any modifications they're willing to pay for that piece of it um they're not expecting us to to pick up any of that charge how is there somebody in that office the foundation full time or is it just a place to that be my question so in speaking with Greg he said he is often there more than not and so yeah he's he's there quite a bit and so their work is going to shift a little bit but they're still going to be doing a lot of work in the community and so he, yeah, he, he doesn't like to work from home. He likes to be in an office, so he wants a designated office space. That's important to him and to the foundation going forward. So you need two things from us, a 
dollar amount and the okay for A and B, correct? Correct. So are these places are already being heated and stuff anyway, so we won't have it. Yes. Yeah. If, if we put walls, we have to watch the zone heating and air conditioning. That's the only thing I would bring. It could get way more expensive than one thinks to block this off and do that, or because that thing's. Yes, that'd be my. That's the only thing that ever comes up when we talk about this building already. Well, what is there? I mean, eight, nine. I don't. Know. Ten verses. Ten, ten verses. Ten verses. The only problem with that. That'd be my only concern. I perfectly fine with them moving in there, but if we're going to do a bunch of work, we just need to know put them in the right zone. <laughs> well, and you speak to that. How much space do they need? Do they have? He just needs an office. I mean, it's a small. Well, what about ADIC though? Maybe two? Two. And you already have those. I already have like two offices kind of blocked off that they use when they're in. So maybe that would try to be in there one or two days a week. So they already have offices that are designated for them. And I just call it fair. Right. We kind of thought we could just bring him in, have him take a look, and then have some discussion. I know Trish, you kind of had an idea already if two of her. We have a small little hallway with one office, and we just thought that we can move the door back um, so that that office would be accessible to the public. So, would they have need for getting their own phone service, their own data service, or is the county providing them data service? For the two fifty, that would be. Well, and that's something we can discuss with Barb. I mean, if we are already providing the Wi-Fi, how much use would one office? Maybe our seats already there two days a week. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those person. are items we can discuss and just decide how we want to bill out or if we want to put an additional charge on it or if the 250 suffices. I can ask Barb, you know, is this a, a huge drain on resources? Is this a significant additional cost? Because most of our phone system is done through the Wi Fi. Um, if we needed to have them put in a landline, they could probably pay to put in the line and then pay their monthly maintenance costs on it too. Mr. Edge, my experience with uh, one building and multiple renters um, is a lot of times they go by the, not by the space, but by the square foot. In fact, I know one in charge is by the square foot on the wall too, okay, hang a picture. I know, it's crazy, but I'm just telling you. So, you yeah. I want to look at, you know, you still get 250, but say it's a 25 square foot building, you're charging 10 bucks a square foot. That way, if somebody else comes in, you can say, this office is this much, if the other one's a little bit bigger, this one's this much. I think there should be something in the wording too that they want something extra. When you talk about the Wi Fi's or whatever, I am mine. Yeah, you're aware that I will be able to. Well, we'll have to draw a police. We'll have to have Michael draw a police. But I didn't want to go through all that work and do all of that if it wasn't something you all were comfortable with. Um, so knowing that you're comfortable with it, we can have Michael draw up a lease and address those things with Barb and then bring that document back for you to approve. Are you guys so all good with the no, I mean, if you guys are comfortable with us moving forward on this, we'll move forward and then bring back the documents and, and all of that for approval. How long and term are they looking for? Trish, do you know how long they're looking for? For the ADRC, I think permanently. And the foundation, I, that I couldn't tell you. I, I don't know if he's looking at that to be a permanent solution or if he's waiting to see if something else opens up. I, I'm not certain. I would have to have that discussion. It would be advantageous for us to do at least a year at a time or something like that. Yeah. To make a motion to do that, but after Michael takes a look at it, comes up. But I think a minimum of 250. Yeah, what we'll do is they'll bring that back with the leasing. We'll approve everything at that time period. It sounds like everybody's okay with it. You know, having them go forward with it, we may angle a little on price, but I. I think we're fine. So, okay. Good, good. Thank you. Uh, get the fee for per picture hang on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah, yeah. I know All right, moving on to number 12. Uh, discussion and possible action relocation of extension office. Uh, 
that's why you're here. Let's try to figure out. Chloe. Yeah. Okay, so um, as you all know, in our last closed session update and for the um, the memo that has been released publicly, the uh, university is handing us back the keys on July 1, meaning they will no longer have a presence, maintenance, any of those things out at the campus. That being said, it was brought to our attention that it doesn't really make a lot of sense to heat and cool and provide services in a building for you know five or six people, especially a building as large as Melville Hall. Um, and so the only place that we know of that would be a permanent place that has space is the fairgrounds. Um, you know, in looking at the size of the fairgrounds, we have um, two part-time staff that, and then one full-time staff um, that's really in their offices daily. We know that. Lyrica is only at the fairgrounds office Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so we do believe we could make that work in the main office space for the four desks in that area and then put landing pads out in the conference room area so that, you know, Adam or whomever else is in the area, not on a daily basis, but are regional, they have a place to come and utilize if they need to have an office so they could, you know, put their laptop in, hook it up. We could have monitors set up there and that way. Uh, we did this in our public health area and in our social services area for some of our social workers. And it honestly worked out really, really well for people that don't need to be in the office on a daily basis. It still provides them space. They can buzz in and buzz out when they need to. Um, I know Adam raised privacy as, as some of that, but you know, the other office area has two doors that close. So if you're sitting in the conference room area and you're, you're in there alone, you will have privacy. Those doors close. Um, so that's really the only option that we have because previously they were located in the community services building and they didn't feel like that was a good fit for them because people couldn't just walk in and out and, you know, they weren't as easily accessible where the fairgrounds, they can walk in out easily accessible. They have a lot of events out there anyway. Um, if we may need to make some modifications to that conference room, you know, if we, they need a stove or things like that. We acknowledge that. I talked with Barb. Um, we'll have to do some stuff with the Wi-Fi. And they are actually testing out the phone now. And so far it's working. So, um, you know, the technology questions are, are good. We've answered those. So that's my solution that I can come up with based on that conversation of where, where else can they go? What else could we do? I'm definitely open to any other thoughts, ideas, and suggestions. Well, but I, July 1. I personally thought the office was always underutilized thing. Being the fair only one we had here. Well, we need it all winter, really. That's what I mean. It's been underutilized. Yeah. The only thing is we'll have to give Adam a canoe for every 10 year plus. It's going to get to work. Well, and we know there is other space challenges. We may have to get a shed for some of their items, um, things like that. We know that because they do have a lot of stuff um, just because of all the programming that they do. Um, but again, it's not a significant cost and it's something that would then allow us to at least give them a space that we can make work. Um, it makes sense. I like the idea. I do question the weekend affair because that place should be staying with the fair. But in the week of the fair, they can work remotely. Just one week. Well, pretty much everybody works that for the extension conference. He's out there anyway. Yeah, if they're aware that makes that room's a turmoil for a thing. That outer room is, yeah. Yeah. Um, but they can work remotely for that week. Well, even the back. Or I mean, if they really need an office, they could come up here and use, you know, the this room or whatever. I mean, for a week, we've got the conference room downstairs. We can make something work if we need to. Um, I mean, like I said, I'm open to any other ideas, but we're out of space. I mean, we just don't have space. That's that's the biggest problem. Is we don't have it. Mr. Carroll, I just wanted to add anything you wanted to discuss. Well, I guess you know that's definitely your guys' decision on where to put space. Um, Ellen thought to go. I obviously feel that there isn't enough space there to. 
fully executes needs. If it's a temporary situation, I get that. Mark's been on our committee before. He knows how I feel about space and the availability for programming and, and things that are outlined in our. One thing I did bring with you guys is to have it, the uh, partnership agreement. It, it is not a legal binding agreement it's at all. I think I admitted to the committee that's the first meeting here a week ago. There are some things that would significantly have to change. I, I guess, you know, not knowing what's happening with the campus building either. Is it worth going? You know, we had similar conversations before. I get it, it's expensive to uh, use those facilities, utilities on those utility things. But we, I'd really like to see the venture has to say before we start remodeling these. But, Whatever is decision is made, we will make work. I think we keep moving in the smaller corner basis, I guess. Anybody with questions? What about who's all on? Sandy and Carlene? Any comments, Sandy or Carlene? If they're still on. Uh, yeah, my, my question this is more of a permanent or a temporary solution that we've taken up with this. Uh... At this point, we don't know. Uh, again, we don't know what we don't know. Um, we don't know if those buildings out at the campus are going to be viable. And if they're not viable, then, you know, they can't, obviously, we can't move them back out there. Um, we don't know if this building and the building next to us are going to be considered as viable going forward. So what does that mean for everyone? And potentially then if they say, you know, one building is viable and the other building isn't, well then, you know, at some point that's that's a whole bigger discussion and then we can build in space. I mean, it could go so many different ways at this point that we but don't- It sounds like we're gonna have answers soon, right? About what's viable, what's not viable. Not until the end of July which is, again, after the campus is closing the doors and pulling, and even then, once we have answers, how much longer until we can take any sort of action is the next big question. And do we really want to continue, again, to heat and cool? We don't even know what those costs are. That's another big piece of this puzzle. We can't get costs on what it's costing us to heat and cool each building. You know, if, if we had that, we could at least make some sort of educated, okay, we'll give it six months, we'll give it four months, we'll give it, but because we can't get that data, it it's darn near impossible. I know what it costs to heat and cool Trisha's building, and that's a much smaller building. Thank you, go ahead. So, I hear you on that. I'm just wondering, is there any way we can wait a little bit? I mean, if we know that this could be a possibility. Do can we wait till we have a little more data? I guess the thing that I don't want to see is to have us move them all the way out there and then potentially move. I mean, they just went through two different moves. Like wait till October. Like wait. I mean, I know it's going to be a cost, but like could we? And the cost is significant. Trisha's building is twenty six hundred dollars a month to heat. And, and cool. there's no way to like localize that in an Aldo Hall. It's not. They don't have ten different HVAC systems. <laughs> No, they haven't worked with the state of the city. Right. And so, I mean, if you multiply that over the warmest months out of the year and then into the cooler months where you're going to have to turn the heat on, is it really, I mean, fifteen, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000? Is it really worth it? I mean, that's really what we're talking about here. And that's, that's the hardest part is we want to think of it in a human way, which I understand, but there's a lot of dollars and cents here too that we really have to think about um and that's where i'm getting approached is how much is that costing us and why would we leave five or six people out there or why wouldn't we move more staff out there then and at least make use of the space but i'm not getting the feeling that that's going to be a viable option at this point having one big boiler out there scares the hell out of me and them air conditioners out there scare the hell out of me i mean there's like nothing new out there Right, right. You know, thing out there that they're. <laughs> I mean, you might be surprised. Missing a new boiler might cut your energy bills by thirty percent. 
but why invest in a new boiler if the building's not viable? That's what I mean when I'm saying right. down this road. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that that is the difficulty. Um, now, can I ask Venture to weigh in on that particular building? I certainly could. Are they going to be willing to do that at this stage? Be nice to Potentially. But the first thing they looked at, they, that wouldn't be a bad idea. They go, you know, you're looking at all these different buildings. Could you start here and give us some indication? Do that. We can, we can, if you're going, everybody's good with it. We can back next month, see if you get the answer. Hi, this, this is Sandy Campbell. Can I just say a couple words? <laughs> go ahead, Sandy. You're talking about moving us out to the fairgrounds, and I think everybody fails to realize that it does take longer than just a week to do the fair. There will be a lot of stuff that leads up to the fair, and it's usually you start in January, and maybe you don't work every day of the month, but you still have to have room out there to um, work. And that means at fair time, we spread out all of the stuff in that conference room. And as far as having four of us in that office or whatever you're talking, this it's just not going to work. We have no place to store any of our stuff, even if you get a shed. It doesn't matter. We have to have we have to have our stuff with us so that we can do our job. And so putting us in the fair office, I don't think is even feasible myself. I understand that you don't want to leave us out here, but this makes our programming so much more difficult by putting us all into one little space. And I guess I personally don't feel it will work, but if that's what happens, all right. But um, it's just, you're just putting us all into a really hard spot as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Sandy. Carly, did you want to comment? Um, yeah, I, I agree with what Sandy said. I really don't feel that's an adequate space for the programming that we provide for the county. Um, we do have a lot of educational supplies and materials that we do access. Um, so I, I think it would be, you know, not really adequate space for the programming. Um, the other comment too, is I think looking at it, um, as Candace said, they don't really have the information yet or the data to see what the cost would be. So rather than maybe jump into it, to me, it seems feasible that, you know, we give a few months and find out what that would be. Um, I do believe this building does have individualized heating. So, it, you know, I know like the other end, Pippin, we turn the heat on when we have a program, we turn it off during the day when we don't, or if there's nobody in that end of the building. So I think there would be some cost savings or, you know, that it wouldn't probably cost as much to heat as um, as if you were heating the entire building. So um, I guess I would recommend, you know, maybe getting that data and that information before making a move um, if that would be a possibility. Thank you. That's kind of what it sounds like. We're going to see if uh, Administrator Pesh can get us more information and we'll put it on next <laughs> agenda and uh, continue to discuss it. I guess everybody else in here. The only other thing I'd like to add is if we don't put them there, where do you propose we put them? Because then we'd be renting space somewhere else to we put. We just keep the building we have and then right now we're on. That's what may be the other thing. I don't know. We're, we got to get smart. Yeah. So, I mean, th yeah. these are all things that I have sat and racked my brain about. So, if you all have other ideas and thoughts, by all means, please share them. Well, I think with the first thing we got to understand where we started. So, we started in a building that we sold. That's where extension was at. And that was probably adequate for the most part, I would say. So, if we look at that footprint, what that building was, how many square feet it was. Because the thing that we're not thinking, they've made this point. There's things that they do all throughout the whole year, whether it's cooking classes or it's whatever it may be for the 4-H or whoever, or if you're having a chemical class or whatever, whatever the case may be, it takes a certain amount of space. And if we're gonna provide the service to the county with extension, then we gotta, we gotta figure out a way to make that happen. I mean, at the end of the day, that's that extension department has a lot more roots in the county than one is probably aware of. So we can't just look at it like, 
well, we're going to show you know we're going to go here we're going to go there it's got to be feasible it's got to work and it's got to make it so it works for the county too so i think it's going to take way more than what we're ready to do right now and i get it candace but it, it's going to take some time to figure out because i'm tired of moving them i mean that's twice we've moved them and i don't want to do it again so i want to figure out what we can do to okay this is your home this is the home you're going to stay in we're going to find it. We're going to do whatever we have to do to make that happen. And I think that's what we got to do. That's it, it's going to take some more time to do that. And a lot of that will be answered the middle of July. You don't want to get the campus report. Well, I mean, as long as you all are aware of the cost that's associated with that, that's all I'm saying. Because it's a, it will be significant. Okay. Moving on to 13. Discussion and possible action on grounds maintenance at UW campus. Lawn care and general administration. Okay, so I've been able to speak with Josh about what we anticipate the need will be to maintain the ground. And so what the thought is, is about 20 hours a week um, for all of the yard maintenance, all of that kind of stuff. And so what we're gonna propose is that we hire just a temporary summer help um, $18 an hour to do all of that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're sitting right now because we hate, we don't want to buy a mower and we don't know if Flatville's going to leave the mower that's out there or not. Um, so if nothing else, well, we have to rent one, we'll, we'll figure out the equipment side of it, but it will be, you know, a person for 20 hours a week because the staff we have, it's just not adequate to do it. Um, at this point, and then rather than make a decision on a full time staff that we don't know if we need summer help just seems the way to go. There's probably a college kid or somebody that would be willing to do that and, and take care of that. So that's kind of what we're thinking. And then we're um, hoping to have just someone do a walkthrough, um, you know, once a week, take a look at everything, make sure nothing's leaking, make sure that. Every, because right now, the only way we find out is if someone from the UW system sends us an email, oh, by the way, this happened, oh, by the way, that happened. So we're going to need somebody to go and do those walkthroughs and kind of take a peek at everything. What about the maintenance guy that said Simons, as far as a walkthrough? I'm not saying fixing stuff, but I mean, there's a right there's yep. an option. Where I think we could. And you got to do something with that. Exactly. I mean, because we just hired that, right? So they, they just filled that position. Yep. To have him walk in. Well, weekly is probably not enough, no. in my opinion, because if the water line breaks, and you wait, if it breaks on Monday and you just did your walkthrough and you don't come back till the next Monday, I mean, unless you see the water run out the door, if it breaks at eight in the morning and you don't walk until eight the next morning, you're screwed. Yeah. You know, I mean, that would be if we could talk with Mike and see it. Mike Hardy out at the assignments to see if we can figure that out. I think that would make perfect sense. Well, and, and thankfully, too, I mean, with the increased collaboration between all of our maintenance staff, even if we had to rotate it or something, I think we yeah, could make that work. Um, we've got um, a lot more of a skill set now, too. I mean, we've got a lot more talent between all of our different maintenance people um, so that if we do have an issue, I think we can address a lot more of them in-house than we have been able to previously, too, which is nice. So um, I don't think Mike would have an issue with Troy maybe taking some time to do that. And if we have to pay an additional hour or two here or there, it's still well worth it. Um, so I will have that discussion with Mike. We got that part time person for mowing and stuff. I'm sure that's going to roll right over to the one that puts the snow mowing. Well, uh, the snow plowing, we kind of think we can handle um, as of right now because, you know, Randy's got the truck now, Chad's got the truck. And like Chad said, I mean, he'd be more than happy to come and help out too. So I think, you know, we'll address that as the fall kind of comes along. And we've got Brian Thielman too. Who, doesn't have, but in the winter time, he's there to help with Randy. And, so I think. Yep. 
But with Brian in the winter time, in the winter months, his we know he'd be doing snow plowing and then helping Randy or helping do other maintenance. So I think that could potentially work. So I think we can maybe revisit that in the fall once we've kind of seen. And once we, again, the study will be done and we'll maybe know more about those buildings too by then. We, we just, and just for general info, I did, I did talk to the gentleman that was the head of maintenance out there for over 20 years. And I asked him how long it took to mow. Yeah, but they, they were mowing everything at that time, the stock the fields and up on the hill. And they, they had two six foot mowers and it would take two guys two full days to mow everything. You know, if you know Ever Newberry, he had a time down with that. Anybody else with any other questions on that? We'll have some answers soon, and then if you're really bored, you can stick around until 6 30 because we got a camera. Should be ready, so uh, <laughs> 14 discussions and possible actions to set future meeting dates and or time. You're good with where we're at now. Can I add that? That's fine with me. Yeah. I think the second I think it as is. What are we? Second, second. second. Second Tuesday of each month at 5 p.m. All right, we're good with that. Correspondence. Did you get my letter I sent to you, Candace? Sent me a letter? No, I, put, I put my bio in it. Oh, yeah, I got that. What's correspondence? Someone that is a political cartoonist that just sent it to me he didn't say for the board or anything, but it, it's pretty good. And they were submitting it to some papers in the area. So it's on my little whiteboard in my office. Okay. Like to see. 16, future agenda items. I have one to review the ARPA wish list. Chair, can I add on to that? Yes. So we've mentioned the strategic plan tonight. And so that is supposed to go through. Uh, I remember I just looked at it yeah. and the reason is looking through like what have we done so far so I know we used to have a spreadsheet that had that what's on the admin page is not the updated I'm not sure where to find the updated I don't think we are either but we'll look and I was wondering if we could maybe review that there's a lot that's changed like I'm impressed with how much as a county we've gotten through on that when we put that together I kind of thought a lot some of that stuff was going to be pie in the sky type of things and so impressed with that, but I think we need to start thinking about, okay, we've gotten through this much, then what is going to be our next steps as a county? What do we want to look at? Which ties in with looking at ARPA fund. It, look, it ties in with the capital improvement plan, um, all of those things. And so just yeah, having a- Campus region big Yeah. So I think we, we need to be aware of what we have, what we're doing, where we're going. So if we could review that and maybe look at when we need to, because I think on the next time, since we had just done it, I don't think we necessarily have to like, Redo the whole document. Maybe it would just be like an update with new goals. I'm sure. We did that with um, Southwest well, and Planning I, Commission. It is something on our to do list to re look at the strategic plan. I, I mean, so we can definitely bring that back and show you. Yep, we've accomplished all these things because Derek and I have looked at it recently, and we were the same way. We're like, look at the stuff we've gotten done. This, but. I think we're going to have new challenges, new goals. I think a lot of things are going to flush out in the next three to four months, especially with this campus situation. I just think there's a lot that's very fluid. So I think there may be time and a need to relook at like, what do we want that to be? But I definitely think that yeah, circling back and, and looking at what we've accomplished and where we're at is a good thing. I think we have new board members that might have new goals and ideas and thoughts that we should take into account. So I think we're supposed to look at the work plan part of that at least. I think quarterly is what I remember us setting it at. When, go we, back and look. when we initiated it, we were like, okay, now we need to review this work plan quarterly. I'm not sure that's going to happen. Can you imagine how easy our job would be? <laughs> Yeah. Along those same lines, is there anything we need to do with, as far as the comprehensive plan kickoff, or is that? They're coming, no, nope, they're coming to brief you at the board meeting on the 21st. Right. Um, they're working on it. They've been working on it. I've met with them to just kind of go over some of it, and so okay. it's on track. They didn't seem well. No, that was the housing. Never mind. Yeah. Housing. If there's nothing else, we're getting into the Oh, Mr. 
Yeah, there's, I've had questions on how the revenue sharing, uh, they've adjusted that whole formula, and we got an increase, I saw, 67%. But I saw other counties had far larger increases, and I wondered, do we understand how that new formula works, and why other counties got such large, so much larger increases than what Mitchell County got? One county got twenty nine hundred percent. Adams County got a twenty nine times increase, uh, large increase than what we did. And I don't know how that formula works now, but it's a whole new formula. And if we understand that, maybe we have a chance of getting more revenue from the state. You have to change the formula again. Yeah. Well, I, I'm saying we, talking about Senator Burke, how that formula works. we don't know how it works. It's a complicated formula. Right. Do you know that some of the counties that had the large percentage increases, it was because they were getting such a small piece before? Yeah. Okay. So maybe uh, maybe and I know that like forested counties had very low shared revenue, and so they got a little bit more of a percentage boost, even though Real dollar wise, they probably still don't have as much to do. But yeah, WCA had some information on that too, where they put out a table of who all got what. Yeah, I can I can dig out what I can on that. Yeah, I'm curious sure. how this whole thing works. And yeah, can we? Oh, what the conference? I didn't, well, the conference materials are still up, so I can look at that too, um, and see if I can't just find just that PowerPoint to share with you sure. as well. Item, or is this just something to look into? I, I, mean, I think it'll take a while it? unless you think you can have it done by next month. Oh, I'll just have it done in five minutes. I have nothing else. To say. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so <laughs> moved. Mr. Manning, I was not. Oh, he was doing it. So, actually, the plan is really That was for my original plan to break this out. Not only do we need to review it, we also need to have it updated by 20. Looks like you have a new job. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. That's the role of this committee was to review it. If we need to do something separately with it, then we just need to start discussing it. Because I know budget's going to start well, happening, agree. and that takes a lot of time. I agree with the administrator. I mean, we can start thinking about it, but it, it may change the right. budget changes out there. Yeah, and I just I don't think it's going to be nearly as much work as last time because we have such a good document. It's just going to look at like plugging in new things that we want to do. Well, and I, I don't have a five year to ten year plan? This was a two to three year plan. So it yes. lasts through the end of twenty twenty four. The comprehensive plan is supposed to be whatever yeah. ten years. Yeah. Yes. Because also it's not gonna be five year plan or a ten year plan. Yeah. We don't have that. And they change that would be great. We do not have that current. Oh, like, there's another job for you, Nicola. <laughs> and it's not five year or ten year because every year you have to Yeah. But they have a And just coming off public safety, I'm going to keep reminding people and reminding you got to think about a jail. Well, and that was in the strategic plan to be looked at, and that's one of the things that we've kind of no. waited on. So, well, and, and again, once we have the right. results, we'll know exactly what all we really need to be looking at because it may be bigger than just a jail. Right. I mean, it really may. We just don't know yet um, until we we hear those and see those findings. So, so people all tell them they go, huh? Oh, they go, that's new. All right, Manning, you're up. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second in my range. All those in favor of adjourning. Aye. 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 Aye.